and welcome to a shock the fourth wall Well, it's time to put an end to the Hellraiser comic reviews. While everything we've looked at has been pretty much from the epic comics line, I feel like we've gotten a nicely diverse range of stories. From holiday specials to just straight-up anthologies, from an interesting story lacking Pinhead except as a background cameo, to an entire weird miniseries devoted to him, Hellraiser as a franchise has worked out a lot better in comics than, say, The Thing or Silent Hill. Hell, even a Nightmare on Elm Street you have to fudge the timeline a bit for some of the better stories in the Wildstorm comics to work. Hellraiser, though, has a storytelling engine that doesn't even require its central elements, Pinhead, the Lament configuration, or characters like Kirstie to actually appear in them. Sure, in the movies you'd be hard-pressed to have a Hellraiser movie without Pinhead, but even in Hellraiser Judgment he was more of a minor player for most of the movie, an authority figure that another order of demons went to. And it can be argued that his presence was that much more powerful by the restraint in using him. Thus, Hellraiser in comics, while some like the Boom Studios books are all about those original elements from the first two movies, have been able to do more and be more consistently enjoyable than in other horror franchises we've seen on this show. But one thing we haven't explored yet, but that we'll close things out on is... CROSSOVERS! It's been said that one of the proposed endings for Freddy vs. Jason would have seen the titular slashers dragged back to hell, only for Pinhead to chain them up and ask, Gentlemen, what seems to be the problem? An awesome idea for a setup that would be on par with Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash, since Pinhead is the next perfect addition for a matchup with those two. You've got one talking killer who's all jokes, one completely silent, and one to act as the straight man while still being immensely powerful himself. Sadly, while that would never happen, Epic Comics did have two crossovers for Hellraiser. The first was Hellraiser vs. Nightbreed, Jihad, which pit the Cenobites against the monsters of Clive Barker's lesser celebrated creation. Some were disappointed I wasn't covering that one, but I just don't know enough about Nightbreed to really dive into it. Instead, the crossover we're looking at is an entirely different series I don't know enough about. Martial Law. Martial Law is another book that came out of Epic Comics and created by Pat Mills. Mills had been one of the people behind the 2000 AD book in England and, in turn, helped develop Judge Dredd. Apparently, Martial Law was something of a parody of Judge Dredd, Except in this case, the ultra-violence was focused not on criminals, but superheroes. In this world, superheroes and superpowered beings are much more common, with most of the U.S. Army's forces being superpowered to the point where they don't feel pain anymore. And apparently this led to widespread sadism, where they inflict pain on others simply because they can't feel it themselves. The character of martial law was one such soldier, but while he's outwardly a douchebag, he has a strong moral compass and was disgusted by the horrors of war and atrocities committed by superheroes during his time in the army. Thus later, he became employed by the government to hunt down and kill superheroes who had gone rogue. The original miniseries saw martial law trying to take down public spirit, basically the equivalent Superman slash Captain America pastiche as I understand it. Also, he's apparently a big fan of Hunter S. Thompson given what he wrote on his stomach. Look, I've made no secret of it. I have no patience for this kind of story or character. The thing about these sort of superhero deconstructions is that they have two repeated qualities ad nauseum. One, the failure to acknowledge that we already have a term for those who use extraordinary powers to commit horrible crimes. Super villains! And two, they always push their stories into edgelord, grotesque extremes to try to make us be on the side of those who hate superheroes. It's not enough for a corrupted superhero to just be greedy or prejudiced or a bit cruel. No, 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 no. Superheroes are either naive idiots that just stepped out of a Silver Age comic, or they're pedophiles who bathe in the blood of puppies that they had sex with earlier that day and are ready to graphically torture people for page after page before sleeping on a bed made of dead kittens and laughing maniacally at how they can get away with anything because who would be stupid enough to actually think that someone is interested in helping people, am I right? And there are plenty of deconstructions out there that work. Watchmen, Squadron Supreme, The Mighty, Kingdom Come, just off the top of my head. But these kind of stories turn superheroes into the kind of people that even Cenobites would say, Dude, could you tone it down a bit? There's certainly a place and an audience for these kind of stories, but it's not me. I frickin' love superheroes, and I reject outright deconstructions and satire like martial law or the boys. Stuff made by people who hate them. 
It's not for me. But that brings us to the more interesting question. How does a world of superheroes, even a satirical one like this, interact with a franchise like Hellraiser? Well, let's dig into Pinhead vs. Martial Law and take a look! Issue's cover is kind of bleh. Done more in martial law style, obviously. It's this weird red embossed thing with Pinhead and Law just grappling with each other, and Pinhead looks terrible. Just like some generic angry dude with some pins in his face. Much like the first issue of the Pinhead miniseries, it feels 90s in the worst ways. The title page is. Well, what would happen if Pinhead and Martial Law fused, I guess, with lots of chains and hooks hanging off of him? Massively oversized pins in his gimp-masked face, and whatever the hell that gun is. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. Book one! Hell for Leather! Man, I would instantly love this comic if it turned out it was just about Martial Law going clothes chopping. By the way, the phrase hell for leather just means as fast as possible, which is incredibly ironic since this book gets really slow given the content later. We truly open with Marshall going around in his flying car. I was promised flying cars. And narrating about how he has lost his girlfriend and it filled him with emptiness and loneliness, but has met a new woman who he might be in love with. Only trouble is, she's a superheroine. Her name is Supernova. And she's brightened up my life. Because she exploded. Flying really presses my buttons, you know. Duck or a frisbee, if it flies, it turns me on. Your new girlfriend wants to have sex with a frisbee or a duck, Marshall. These are not relationship goals. She admits that Marshall reminds her of her father, a flying superhero who wore a mask and always wore it all the time, so she never got to see his face. She also might want to have sex with her dad. I can see how your life has been brightened. But no, he's apparently into that and says, Come to daddy. Before they have sex in the plane. So, you know, he's full of good decisions today. I know, I know. A lot of people will call me a hypocrite. Well, mostly I'll call you an idiot for doing this while in flight. I'm meant to be a superhero hunter. But first and foremost, I'm a man. I am a man! <sighs> hey, hey, those are mine. Are we ever going to actually do my show? Yes, late night double feature is going to happen, Clive! They land at what I think is supposed to be a parody of Four Freedoms Plaza from Marvel, except in this case it's a number five inside of a question mark. I kind of actually dig that design idea, even if the execution is lacking. Anyway, once there, Supernova explains that one of her powers is actually a powerful form of telepathy. She can make mental contact with not only other galaxies, but other dimensions. That's how I met the Dark Ones. Dark Ones? You know, YouTube commenters. No, she made contact with the Cenobites. Cenobites. Demons, you'd call them. They're battling for control of Earth. And if they win, this planet goes. What's at stake is eternal damnation. I'm trying to communicate with them. Do a deal, because that's how I see myself. As a systems buster. I want to bust their whole plan wide open. By... negotiating with them? I feel so much love for the Cenobites. Love for demons? Yes, because they are our missing half. In order to be whole again, we must unite with them. Feel their pain. You're kind of an idiot, aren't you? Oh, and just to really show off the edgelord equality here, enjoy this sequence of Superman being tortured by Cenobite versions of his rogues gallery. I feel their suffering. 
So much pain and unhappiness. Nah, that's just me after having to read anything involving Atkins. Supernova's definitely out to lunch, but I've got my luncheon vouchers. And box of condoms. You can't eat that. Marshall says he doesn't understand any of that, but just asks her to be careful, which... Wow, Marshall's a more supportive boyfriend than, like, 90% of other characters in fiction. They're at the tower to attend a superhero therapy party. Now, one might think, oh, hey, is this comic actually going to address the concept of mental health and superheroes better than frickin' Heroes in Crisis did? Eh, not really. Both are terrible, just on opposite sides of the spectrum. Heroes in Crisis at least acknowledge that mental health concerns are an issue for superheroes, this book just says, Therapy for superheroes is people being self-indulgent, hedonistic morons in the guise of help. For instance, hot tub therapy, which is just a dude having sex with a mermaid in a hot tub. Color therapy, wherein they add color to darker costumes. And a form of therapy where it's getting enemas to try to revert you to a regular human. Well, I always knew superheroes were full of sh**. Considering how much of it comes out of your mouth, you would know. After an encounter with someone who wants him to drink piss for urine therapy, they meet up with Seraph, an angel-themed superhero whom Supernova is into. Probably because of the wings, honestly. Supernova's been feeling a little sick, but Seraph seems to radiate some kind of energy that heals her. While Marshall disapproves of the holier-than-thou attitude, though this guy seems perfectly polite, Marshall accepts that maybe his dickish attitude is hurting Supernova. She decides to go to one of Seraph's workshops to look after her own health a bit, Marshall in tow. At said workshop, Tonight, I want to show you how you can step free through grace into other dimensions, to ascend into a new and marvelous realm beyond time and space. Oh, good thing we're starting small here. However, he says the means by which they can ascend is through a lament configuration. He claims that people will be transformed by the radiant light as it changes one's molecular resonance or whatever, but that others will be tormented by it if they refuse to accept it. Somehow, the close proximity of the box causes Supernova to fall over and have difficulty breathing. Seraph claims to heal her as she hyperventilates, but then wants to adjust her aura a bit leading to Marshall punching him away. The other heroes in the workshop pull him back. Marshall, Seraph's only trying to help her. He wouldn't lie. He's a good guy. He's got wings. There is logic in what he says. Seraph claims the box will deal with your pain at a subatomic level within the DNA and soul itself, enabling you to go through the pain barrier into the higher realms. Somehow, I feel like even if this didn't summon Pinhead, that Seraph would be experiencing some pain barriers himself soon. Marshall decides to give it a shot and opens the box, although instead of summoning the Cenobites, this one transports Marshall and Supernova to hell. They're confronted by this Cenobite, who might actually look cool in live action. Some kind of dude with hooks sticking out of him, but more interestingly, a bunch of IV bags hanging over him. What are your hidden fears that you deny even to yourself, Marshall? Fear of disease and decay? Clearly, Peter, your torso is warm. But what of your arms? Marshall just shoots the Cenobite and Seraph moves on to other possible fears. First up is fear of castration, which Marshall just kicks the Cenobite in the balls and stabs him with his own giant clock tower scissors. And then fear of the beast, meaning some kind of weird dinosaur Cenobite, which while cool in concept, just looks like a T-Rex with a few bits of metal sticking out. I want a proper dinosaur centibite now. And finally, Seraph realizes this is going nowhere, so instead goes for fear of someone else's pain and takes Supernova hostage. Seraph's facade quickly vanishes, revealing that he too is some kind of centibite. No doubt you are imagining all the unspeakable things I'm going to do to her, Marshall. For your own brain is the supreme torturer. The brain never gives you peace. And my brain hurts. Ah, I see you've read Marvel then. That would be a torture of hell. An excellent initiation into hell, Seraph. This martial law is indeed a worthy offering on account for your continued existence. I'm not technically allowed to torture Atkins, so this is the next best thing. And yep, Pinhead is finally here. 
and weird sequential art decision here. These two panels show Pinhead in shadow, then from behind at the bottom of the page. You'd think that would mean this is the big dramatic reveal of Pinhead on the next page. Take up the whole thing, or maybe just a large panel for the reveal, but nope. Close up of his T-zone, then a pullback of just his face. Weird. The fears Seraph introduced you to perform a vital function. For fear is essential to the human race. Only through fear can blessed order be maintained. Yes, my fear of dinosaurs truly does keep me on the structured path. Without it, humans would not work, go to war, or obey their leaders, and instead lie idly in the dirt, succumbing to the wasteful disease of chaos. And here's where Pinhead starts shilling his self-help book. That is why, through countless millennia in the name of our beloved Leviathan, we Cenobites have inoculated the human race with fear for their own good, inserting it deep into the DNA itself. Fears of reptiles, insects, darkness, but above all, fear of pain. Yeah, nobody would be afraid of pain without you, dude! Apparently the Cenobites are like breeding children to carry irrational fears, and this will lead to... order, I guess? You fragging bastards! You're behind all the misery of the world! Of course. OF COURSE! Our Lord always intended the Earth to be a veil of tears. Hey, remember when Cenobites were just a bunch of freaky-looking demon things who shoved some chains into ya because they didn't understand the difference between pain and pleasure? And now apparently they're the cause of literally all misery on Earth? I thought you'd be pleased, Marshal, for judging by your tasteful SS-style uniform, you appear the very symbol of order and control. You got that wrong, pal. I'm no Nazi. Jeez, you dress up like a Nazi and suddenly everyone thinks you're a Nazi. Marshal punches Pinhead all of once because we need Pinhead to monologue some more. Supernova wants to know why they can't just live peacefully, but Pinhead says her naivete is nice because they like to destroy such innocence. Supernova's confused because she sensed so much pain the Cenobites were in, but said Cenobites just say it's fun for them. I don't understand. Why does your god want all this misery? Why is he so obsessed with order? It is not for you to question the mysterious ways of the divine divider and ruler, the Lord Leviathan. Well, I guess that helps explain why you thought that nails in your peripheral vision was a good idea. Marshall says that attempting to make a deal with them is what got her sick to begin with, which Pinhead confirms. Making deals with demons always has a price that screws you over. We're gonna find Spider-Man's soul here being tortured by Cenobites, aren't we? Pinhead proceeds to show a bunch of people who opened the Lament Configuration, hoping to get superpowers like that public spirit guy. And ended up here in hell to be tortured while wearing the costume. No doubt you're enjoying this, Marshall. No, they're not suffering enough! Give them more pain! They're meant to be superheroes! They can take it! Gotta love that overwhelming compassion for innocent people who just wanted to have powers to do good, Marshall. You've got the same gentle soul as the Fixer. Thank goodness we're supposed to be rooting for you! After recapping how Public Spirit got people to sign on for all the stuff I talked about at the beginning in Marshall's backstory, Marshall finally has enough and just shoots at Pinhead. With the harpoons that were apparently in his gun. He then stabs Seraph and takes Supernova so they can try to escape. Run, Marshall? How absurd. You are in hell. You won't get anywhere without public transportation. They unleash all the people who were being tortured to attack Marshall. Not sure how that works, but whatever, it's hell. But Marshall is just happy to keep killing people who look like public spirit. Pinhead realizes that there's a deeper pain inside of Marshall, and summons up the image of all those he killed in war, and assisted by war Cenobites, creatures that resemble brutal aspects of military combat. He speechifies about how language is used in war too, to desensitize its aspects, calling horrific burns, thermal injuries, grenades that shoot white-hot shards of metal through bone and flesh, area denial weapons, lung damage from poison gas, respiratory embarrassment, etc, etc. The end result is that Marshall and Supernova are knocked out. Marshall is taken to some kind of hellish surgical theater where Pinhead is the doctor, and has an outrageously huge chainsaw with 18-inch terror saw written on it because apparently there's no superhero in martial law named Subtlety Man. He starts performing surgery on Law to extract the shrapnel that was shot into him without anesthetic. As I was saying, 
The language of pain is all about denial, which is not just a river in Africa. You really wanted to make Freddy vs. Martial Law, didn't you? Supernova is tied to an X-Cross and handed over to Seraph. Issue 1 ends with a bunch of various tools and sharp objects ready to be stabbed into him. And now, Marshall, it's time for a surgical strike. Are you sure you don't need some more sharp objects? I think there might be a few stray atoms that don't get stabbed. Cover for issue 2... Well, as you may have noticed, I don't have the physical copies of these comics, and the scans are not exactly the best out there. I think it's like some holofoil slash embossed thing with Martial Law's badge, but added in some pinhead details, like San Frachuro Pain Department or whatever. This is awful and kind of lame. We open where we left off, only now the stylized artwork has decided to take a step down for Pinhead. In the first issue, he still mostly maintained his calm demeanor, but on this page he looks like he's ranting and screaming at the top of his lungs with Gowron eyes. And he just talks, 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 and my eyes just glaze over, partly from the art that's so energized that it's hard to focus, but also because it's saying nothing. Just because Pinhead is a monster who speaks doesn't mean he has to so much in these books. That's the thing, even when Pinhead is used a lot more in the Hellraiser movies, they make sure to keep what he's saying relatively simple so that it commands more power. Not telling jokes and babbling about how much he's going to torture martial law to understand more about him. Supernova once again asks why they're doing this. Well, Seraph licks at her boob through her costume. Thanks, comic! That's totally necessary! I have to censor it just to be on the safe side for YouTube, even though she's fully clothed, but it's already just a why kind of thing. Anyway, Seraph says the questions are distractions, but Pinhead disagrees. Let us answer her. For ignorance is bliss, and that is not a state we favor in hell. Which is why earlier I said we should not ask questions of Leviathan. I make a lot of sense. Watch, my dear. I have such sights to show you. Pinhead proceeds to pull out his vacation photos. He apparently summons Leviathan here and floating above the surgical theater, explaining that it nourishes itself on fear and trauma and the suffering of humanity. Wars were organized to create that fear and misery, but the masses needed to be pushed towards it, thus the purpose of order. So it's less about order as a philosophical point and more about serving Leviathan brunch. We also see images of Captain Spencer in World War I, as well as people injured during it. Martial Law notices that Pinhead seems to have a reaction to the war images. Leviathan feeds on human consciousness? That's horrible! Is it? The food you exist on contains animal and plant consciousness, to whose fate you are equally indifferent. Tell me, my dear. When did you last spare a thought for the soya beans that comprise your veggie burger? Oh god, they are using Marvel's bullcrap to torture people! Back on Earth, the remaining heroes at the workshop apparently have found, like, a giant lament configuration. The heroes still want to attain the ascension that Seraph talked about, but know there's great danger. As such, they've called on Martial Law's assistant to help. A dude named Razorhead, who literally has a giant razor blade on his head. I've never understood why heroes always want to save the world or gain ultimate power. Why can't they behave like normal people? Yeah, no one wants to save the world. They should act like normal people and stick giant razor blades on their heads. I mean, my idea of a good time is to trap some geek down a dark alley, tell him I'm not gonna hurt him, then slice him up real slow, while I watch the shocked look on his face. I see that Atkins has an equivalent in this universe. Okay, there is admittedly a bit of satire from this guy that I like. Better pretend I'm as strange as they are. Fortunately, I speak fluent cliché too. We must strike now! It's a slim chance, but the only one we've got! That is actually legit funny. You get one point, comic. They somehow force the box open and enter, immediately transported to hell. They encounter some Cenobites and lose a couple of their number, but the others actually ignore the rest because they think Razorhead is a Cenobite from some neighboring hell and don't want to spoil his fun. Back with Pinhead... Superheroes serve a most useful function, Marshal. They provide the cannon fodder for Lord Leviathan. With their brightly colored costumes and effortless powers, they glorify war. No they don't, Pindick! Go to heaven! and act as valuable role models for the sheep-like masses to emulate. 
Exactly. Marshall manages to break free as he proclaims that as much as he hates to admit it, he's a superhero too. The only one too dumb to buy the bullshit. Too dumb to... You're too dumb to buy the... But, but you think that superheroes are... This comic is dumb. The only one that wanted the job of turning on his own. The only one to like dressing up in an SS Stormtrooper uniform. And yet they dare to call me a Nazi! And we get a look at the back of Marshall's outfit, which reads, Dressed to Kill. What sort of backwards fucking pageantry is that? He breaks Supernova out, who's rightly pissed at the Cenobites, thinking they're full of it about the idea that evil rules the world. Um... No, they didn't say they rule it, they said they encouraged activities that help it. There is a difference. Pinhead and Martial Law get into a fist fight and fall into some giant vat of blood, the Cenobites scoffing at Supernova's attitude. And sooner or later, we must all break our hymen of innocence. You know, Hellraiser frequently has shots of hooks and chains pulling at flesh, tearing into skin, and yet it's this comic that feels gross. Pinhead gets impaled on multiple spikes, but easily emerges from it unscathed. Ah, such rapturous pain. And know that everything we were taught, everything we believed in, were prepared to die for, was a lie. A bloody lie! I know, right? I mean, I order the regular chicken nuggets, but they make them in the same stuff as the spicy ones, so they end up tasting spicy anyway. Everything we know is a lie. Marshall and Supernova run off, but Pinhead says they can't escape because they opened the box. And the orchestra of hell is already tuning up its instruments. And, yeah, we see these, like, music-based Cenobites. Welcome to the Symphony of Suffering. Begin the Taylor Swift rap album. With more misery than the finest Italian opera. A concerto of chastisement, where your screams will reach notes higher than the most falsetto boy soprano. Translation, padding, 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 padding. Marshall realizes that there seemed to be a touch of humanity about Pinhead in regards to World War I, so he thinks if they can somehow access that, they may be able to reach him and get away to escape hell. They head to the Abbey, the place where Supernova first made contact with the Cenobites, and thinks the records of who Pinhead was beforehand might be stored there. Because we need to move the plot along. The Abbey is their idea of a perfectly ordered universe, which apparently in Hell's opinion means designed by Tim Burton, and the files themselves are... weird. Basically, the information travels in the form of sound waves that can be transformed into geometric shapes and slapped onto a giant lament configuration. And make a joke about how paper would be more efficient, but this is hell, and overcomplicated bureaucracy and paperwork are kind of a hellish thing, so... They somehow access it and get the info on Captain Spencer, creating a bunch of large images of the whole thing around them. Pinhead arrives and Marshall admits he wants to get to his humanity. You flatter yourself, Marshall. What humanity? What feelings? I don't know, whatever ones that have been shown earlier with your angry expression, or just two panels ago when you were pissed that they were accessing your records? If you want a character to be emotionless, maybe you shouldn't keep having them show emotion! The image of Captain Spencer recounts what he experienced in World War I, particularly the Battle of the Somme, which took place over four months and resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths, and all just for six miles of territory. Pinhead berates Marshall that he would think that this would elicit some pity from him, since instead these experiences led him to Leviathan and the hell he enjoys so much. Pinhead suggests that maybe they should look at Marshall's past lives before his current existence. That's a thing here? And how little things on us are usually a sign of some horrible fate in past lives, like acne meaning bubonic plague, or asthma that you were once smothered or buried alive. So does having to read this garbage mean that I once had my eyes boiled or something? The World War I simulation is apparently still happening around them, and the other heroes arrive. Because this story hates superheroes, they're all morons who don't know how to navigate the trenches of World War I. Getting shot, stuck in barbed wire, poisoned by gas, etc. Pinhead calls them idiots for thinking they can achieve anything in real war. Exactly! 
These costumed bozos with their posing pouches, constipated glares, and inflatable muscles insult the memory of your dead comrades! Oh my god! Green Lantern stopped a giant robot from destroying the city! Clearly this is disrespecting the troops! Yes, they were real heroes. Real supermen. Ignored by posterity because their uniforms weren't colorful enough. Oh, get off the cross. We need the wood. Marshall says he's the one doing something about it. Wiping out the imposters and the phonies. And he asks Pinhead to let him, Razorhead, and Supernova go so he can continue his work. Pinhead agrees, saying they'll entertain themselves by torturing the heroes here for all eternity. The two even frickin' shake hands. They're returned to the tower, where the heroes there are apparently still engaged in their therapy or something. Marshall tells Razorhead that they have work to do now, but Supernova's shocked that he would still want to do all this stuff. Embrace pain and misery like the Cenobites. It's a long bit of rambly bullshit crap, but basically she just says that he needs to let go of his hatred of superheroes and choose love, but he refuses. As such, she breaks up with him. And so our comic ends with Marshall accepting that you can't dictate what people should think or do, and then they join in on some big orgy with a bunch of naked women, because poorly drawn boobs is satire or something. These comics suck. This was already a hard sell for me because I'm not fond of this particular kind of story, but even setting aside the premise, it's just a really annoying, edgelord, pretentious pile of crap. Page after page after page after page of people expositing about pain and suffering and war and how it all feeds the machine of order, man, and superheroes are the real problem. Especially that middle finger of an ending that suggests that superheroes distract people from celebrating soldiers. There's a lot you can critique about the concept of superheroes. Power fantasies, reinforcing ideas of violence being the solution to problems, unrealistic standards of beauty, co-opting the symbols of heroism for hatred, and more like that. But what kind of a joy-kill, snooty, nose-up-your-own-asshole, smug puss bucket do you have to be to say that superheroes keep people from celebrating real heroes? That's like saying, oh, John McClane from Die Hard? I hate that character. He distracts us from celebrating celebrating real-life nurses. They have nothing to do with each other! A lot of the book just feels like padding. Even if you enjoyed the more first-year philosophy student stuff, what the hell was the point of the symphony of suffering? Or the, lol, here's some weird therapy where people drink piss bits. And then there's the art, of course. Kevin O'Neill is actually widely celebrated for stuff like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and the Green Lantern story that was the basis of Blackest Night Later. And as such, I know he has better moments than this. But yeah, I'm not a fan of his style, and it's pretty ugly to look at here. Like Scott McDaniel, too high energy in every panel, too exhausting to read, and very distracting in more than one point. When he's good, he's brilliant, but when he's bad, he's just got really stretchy cartoon characters everywhere that are off-model and terrible to look at. And he does have his moments here, but few and far between. I do actually think there would be something to Cenobites vs. Superheroes, but definitely not this. This was awful, and I hate it, and it makes me glad we are done with Hellraiser comics. Next time, let's celebrate that ending, as well as celebrate the 12th anniversary with some more of the Clone Saga.
Identify yourself. I am Confession, for that is what I demand of my victims. Seems kind of backwards if the victim is the one who's doing the confessing. Shouldn't you be called the listener or something? You joke and jab to protect yourself, but there is no defense against my will. You're not the first creature to tell me that. And you won't be the last. What the hell? You are in my domain, Linkara. You carry only what you have brought with you and nothing else. Wait, then how am I breathing? You're not. You will confess all of your secrets to me. All that makes you weak, all that makes you strong, all the pain will increase. Breathe so that you may speak. I am not telling you anything. Some things you do not need to say. I cannot probe deeply into your mind, but I can go far enough. <gasps> the surface of your mind. You fear the harbinger of Moloch, for you know not the doom it represents. I see you fear yourself and what you would do if you let go. Oh, but this is sweet. You fear to lose those whom you love. Congratulations! You've described the fears of like 90% of all people! I hope that information is helpful! I'm also not fond of roller coasters! You may not fear pain, but that won't stop me from inflicting it. Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!